Well, you know, a great place to find out things you never knew that you needed to know is Facebook. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if you're not on Facebook, these three examples might give you enough uh, evidence uh, to stay off of Facebook. Now, you may have been safe enough to be on Facebook. But the first thing that I learned that I didn't know that I needed to know was how to clean a rusty car bumper with a bottle of Coca-Cola. Uh, the coat cleans the rust right off. The video was amazing. It has over a million hits. The only problem is I don't have a rusty bumper and I don't drink Coke. And so I'm not sure that I needed to know how to do that. All right, another thing that I didn't know that I needed to know was how to catch a gopher with a gallon milk jug full of water. Now, I think one of you might have posted this on my Facebook uh, feed, but you pour the water down the gopher hole, the gopher swims up the water and gets captured in the gallon of water. Yeah, no pictures on this one. It was a, it was a little disturbing. But I don't have a gopher problem in my home. I have an armadillo problem. I have an armadillo tearing up my front yard, and this thing will not be caught by a gallon jug full of water. So I don't know that I needed really to know that. And the last thing that I didn't know that I needed to know was how to use a waffle maker for making things other than waffles. This was a post that, that taught me five things to make in a waffle maker besides waffles. Uh, for example, a hash brown casserole, brownies, and a pizza. Uh, who knew? I mean, why would I get my perfectly good round pizza pan to make a pizza when I can fish out my waffle maker? <laughs> what a crazy world we live in. There are plenty of things that we know that we really don't need to know, that they're not relevant, but we're bombarded with them. They're not important. And so I'd like to remind us this morning that one of the reasons why we come to church to study God's Word is so that we can learn the few things that we must know about God. And so this morning, we are going to set aside the triviality of what to do with a waffle maker besides making waffles, and we are going to focus on four things that you must know are true about God. So turn with me to Psalm 139 in your Bible. Psalm 139 is our text this morning. As you find your way to Psalm 39, let me provide you some background on this psalm. Psalm 139 has a special place in the Psalter, in the book of Psalms. Uh, it may be one of your favorite psalms. It's familiar to many. It's profound and it's beautiful. Many scholars call it the crown of the book of Psalms because of its beauty and because of its language. Uh, but what you may not know about Psalm 139 is that this is a psalm that was meant to be sung in the church. Your Bible, in fact, might have a note at the top of the chapter that says, for the choir director. Do you see that? And so what we're studying this morning are song lyrics, poetry put to music. And this song has four distinct stanzas. There are six verses in each of the four stanzas, 24 verses in total. Each of the four stanzas is going to teach us a different truth about God that we need to know. Just a little bit more background before we jump into the text. Also at the top of the psalm, before the chapter begins, there's a second note telling us that this is a psalm of David. Now you may be aware that different psalms fall into different categories. There are praise psalms, there are lament psalms, there are thanksgiving psalms, there are community psalms. Well, Psalm 39, many feel, falls in the category of being a royal psalm. A royal psalm is a psalm written about the king of Israel. This one is written by the king of Israel, King David himself. And so you'll find that this psalm is written from the first person. It's written with the I and the me. It's not written as a community psalm with the we and the us. This is really like an ancient blog post where King David is sharing with us his relationship with God in a very personal way. It's a royal psalm about the king. And so let's begin with that first stanza, which is verses 1 through 6. David begins by writing, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. And so we'll stop there for a moment and ask the question, what do we learn about God from this first stanza? We learn that God knows. God knows. What does he know? He knows about you, verse 2. You know when I sit down, and you know when I rise up. God knows your daily activities. Did you know that? You know that technology that you have now that will tell you how many steps that you've taken in a day? God was way before that. He knows everything about your daily activities. 
Uh, continuing, you understand my thoughts from afar. God not only knows your physical activity during the day, He knows what you're thinking. He knows your thought life as well. Verse 3, you scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. How much does God know? He knows it all. God never has to Google anything. He knows everything about you. Verse 5, you have enclosed me behind and before, and your hand is upon you. Uh, brothers and sisters, God is not concerned with your privacy rights. God knows everything about you. He's in front of you. He's behind you. His hand is upon you 24-7, 365. God knows. And that's David's point in this first stanza. God knows. And the theological term for this, if you're taking notes in your bulletin, is God's omniscience. God's omniscience, that he knows all, that he knows everything. That's David's point in stanza number, number one, that God knows. And so let me ask you this question before we move on. Does this truth that God knows everything, is that a comfort to you? Or does that scare you a little bit that God knows so much about you? I can think of two situations where God's omniscience is not necessarily good news for you. One is if you're in a, if you're in sin, if you're practicing open sin, then the fact that God knows and that God knows everything about you, even your thoughts, is is unsettling to us. That God knows. In fact, God's omniscience should motivate us to confess sin more, because hey, He already knows that you've done it. He already knows that you've thought it. You might as well confess it to Him. God knows. The second situation where God knowing everything can be a little bit uncomfortable for us is when we talk about suffering. If we believe that God knows what we're going through to every detail, He knows our trials, He knows our pain, but yet He doesn't seem to be doing anything about it right now, that can cause a lot of theological anxiety. If God knows, then we think that He would act. And we're going to talk more about that later. But for David, his confession that God knows everything leads him to worship. Verse 6. David says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Think about David. He has so many responsibilities. He has so much entrusted into his care. For him, it was a wonderful thought that God knew all of the details. That there was nothing that he was unaware of. That brought comfort to him as the king. And I would encourage you, church, also to let this truth that God knows you, that he knows everything about you, to be a comfort to you. Because even though this life is hard, isn't one of the hardest things of life when you're feeling like no one understands me? No one knows what I'm going through. I don't even understand everything that's going on in my mind. The, the complex tangle of emotions that I feel from day to day. Child of God, he knows. He knows what you're facing. He knows you better than you know yourself. We can take comfort in that. We're never truly alone because God knows. Let's turn now to stanza number two. Turn to verses seven through 12. This is the second stanza of this ancient song. And I'm gonna give you the main idea up front this time uh, of the stanza before we get into the text. David's point here is going to be that God is everywhere. That God is everywhere. Look at his rhetorical question in verse 7. David asks, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? And what's the implied answer to this? You can't go anywhere because God is everywhere. You can't flee from God in that sense. Uh, verse, verse number 8, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I may make my bed in Sheol, that is the grave, you are there. This is what's called a merism. In, in poetry, it's a figure of speech where you take two polar opposites in order to communicate the comprehensiveness of everything in between. David's point is not just that God is in two places, God is in the heavens and God is in the grave. His point is to say that God is everywhere in between those two extremes, that God is indeed everywhere all the time. Now the theological term for this expression of who God is, is the term omnipresence. 
omnipresence. A little bit different than omniscience. Omnipresence is all presence. That the presence of God is everywhere. That there's nowhere you can go where God isn't. <laughs> now let me ask that question again. Is the fact that God is everywhere, his omnipresence, is that a comfort to you? Or does that cause you to be uncomfortable? I can again think of two situations where the fact that God is everywhere might not be uh, the best news. First is, when a person is trying to run away from God, the teaching of God's omnipresence is not welcome news to them. If a person is trying to flee from God because of their sin, or just because they want to control their own life, or maybe God has called you to do something that you really don't want to do, and so you try to distance yourself from God, like Jonah, what you find out is, the farther you flee from him, there he is. God is there. And so if you're trying to run from God, you will find that you're not able to do it. So you might as well stop running because God is there where you're at. The second situation where the teaching that God is everywhere can be a challenge to us Christians is again in suffering. Was God in Hitler's concentration camps? He was. Was God in those bloody trenches of World War I? He was. Is God in those Syrian refugee boats where those poor people are trying to find some place to go? He is. Is God in the doctor's office when, when the diagnosis of cancer is given? Is God there when you're served divorce papers? Yes, he is. God is everywhere, then he's in those places. And sometimes it's more palatable to believe in God's absence than to believe in a God who is there, and again, yet seems to allow things to occur that are very troubling to us. And so when it comes to God's omniscience, when it comes to God's omnipresence, for us Christians, they can be both a comfort and a frustration. But even though we might not fully understand how God works in all of these situations, the presence of God certainly is a reason for us to worship Him. David continues in stanza 2. In verse 9, if I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If God is truly everywhere, then he's always available to help you. He's always available to put his hand on your shoulder and to help lead you, if not out of the pain, at least through the pain. Because God is everywhere, he's always available to help us. Verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day, darkness and light are alike to you. Here David represents evil with darkness, and his point is that the presence of evil is always overcome with the presence of God. And so God's presence is a reason to worship. Now the third stanza, the third verse in this song, verses 13 through 18. These are probably the most famous. I'm sure you've heard these before. They're precious words for us, uh, for the church, starting in verse 13. David says, For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. And so we already see in this third stanza that there's a different tone. David is no longer talking about who God is and his characteristics. Now it seems like he wants to talk about what God has done, his abilities, his works. Verse 14, I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. And so what we learn in this stanza is that God is all-powerful. That God is all-powerful. God knows everything. God is everywhere, but he's not a passive God. He's not a God who's inactive. But we have a God who does things, who works in the world. And the greatest illustration of God's power is not found in the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. It's not found in Peter walking on the water. It's not found in all of Jesus' healing of the sick. You know, the Bible says that Satan in the last days will mimic some of those miracles and he will deceive many. But the one thing that Satan will never be able to do is to create life. The creation of life is an illustration of God's greatest power because human beings have no ability to create life. Then they never will. 
The universe itself does not have the power to create life. Chemicals in whatever combination do not have the power to create life. Supercomputers can only create artificial intelligence. They cannot create real life. And Dr. Frankenstein is fiction. There's, there's no power, there's no entity that can create ex nihilo out of nothing except for God. The fact that God creates life is the ultimate illustration of his power, that he is omnipotent. The theological term for this kind of power is omnipotence, all power. God has all power. He is able to do what he wants to do. David continues, verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not even one of them. And so not only does God have the power to create life, but David says it goes beyond that. Not only does God create life, but he sustains life. He determines the duration of life. He controls life and death. When you take your first breath, when you take your last breath, is ordained by God before you were even born. God has that kind of power. A few days ago, just this past week, I had the opportunity, I was invited in someone's home to minister to an elderly woman whose husband of 65 years is dying from a painful disease. And so I went into her home and I opened up to her Psalm 139. And we read stanza number one. And I said to this dear woman, I said, God knows. God knows what you're going through. He knows the pain that your husband's in. God knows. You're on his mind. It breaks his heart. God knows. And then we read stanza number two, and I said to this woman, I said, God is here in this house. He's here in this room with that hospital bed. God is here. They can't go to church right now. So you don't need to go to church. God is here. His presence is with you. His presence is everywhere. And we read the third stanza. And I said, God, God is all-powerful. God creates life. God holds life and death in his hands. He knows the days that are appointed for us. I said, you can trust this God. He knows. He's here. And he has life and death in his hands. And I hope that was a comfort to this family. I think that it was. But even as we talked about the fact that God knows and that God is here, and that God has all power, the other side of that can't help but begin to be seen. And this woman in her pain, she said to me, if God knows everything, if he's here, and if he has all power, then why, why doesn't he lessen the pain? Why are we going through this? Why did this happen to my husband who was so strong all of his life? And I said to her, well, we have to go to the fourth stanza. Psalm 139 does not end with the third stanza. There are four stanzas to this psalm. I said, this psalm is not complete till we go to verses 19 through 24. But unfortunately, these verses are the verses that are left out when this psalm is read. These are the verses that the church doesn't want to sing. The fourth stanza begins this way. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed. <laughs> Psalm 139 takes a little bit of a turn, doesn't it? It takes a little bit of a turn. In this stanza, church, David lodges a complaint against God. Do you see it there? He shouts, oh, that you would slay the wicked, oh God. It's vocative. He's emotional. And implied in this emotional complaint against God, David is saying, I know that you know all things. I know that you're here, that your presence is with me. I know that you have all power, yet at my gates are enemies who seek to do your people harm. At the gates, outside of the palace, are people who seek to rape, pillage, and destroy your people. These are evil men. And if you're the God of stanzas 1, 2, and 3, then how do we handle this? Let's get busy and wipe out these enemies. Verse 20, for they speak against you wickedly. And your enemies take your name in vain. 
God, I know that you know this. I know that you know this. Uh, they speak, and you, we've already said that you know what we speak before we even say it. This is an offense to you, God. Verse 21. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I do. I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. David is saying, Lord, we're on the same side here. I'm on your side of the, of, the, of the family values discussion. I worship you. I confess truth about you. You, you are uh, omniscient. You are omnipresent. You are um, um, omnipotent. I agree with that. And so, verse 23 and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there is any hurtful way in me. Now these verses, rather than being a confession of sin, which is the way they're normally interpreted, I take them as part of David's complaint. That at the end, David says, I have clean hands. Search me. God, try my heart. We've already established that, that you know when I rise up and you know when I lie down and you know my thoughts and you know everything about me. Search me. I have clean hands before you. My sin is atoned for. I'm living for you as best I can, O oh God. There's not sin in my life like there was with Achan, like there was with Saul. I'm doing the best I can as a king, yet these enemies are still at my gate. There's no reason for you not to act against them because my heart is pure before you. Church, this is powerful. Can you relate to this in your life? I bet you can. God, I know that you know what's going on in my life, in my heart, in my thoughts. I know that you're with me. I do not deny you, and I know that you have all power, but yet you have allowed such and such to continue to be at my gate, outside my house. Oh God, I know that you know all, I know that you're everywhere, I know that you have all power, but you have not allowed such and such to leave my life, and I wish that you would. I know that you know all things, and you're everywhere, and you have all power, yet you have allowed this to come into my life, and I don't understand why. This is David's complaint. That we have people in our church, I know, who are looking for different jobs. And God has not opened those doors yet. We have people in this church who are going through financial <clears throat> hardship. And God has not yet provided for those financial needs. We have many people in this church who have lost loved ones that you've been praying for for years to the point that you've almost given up on them. You're like, I know this is your will, dear God, that these people become saved. They're sinking in the deception of sin, but you have not yet drawn them to yourself. Here's what we learned from stanza four, I believe. It's important. Are you ready for it? God's timing is different from ours. God's timing is different from ours. David's question, the woman, the dear woman I met with this week, and probably your question, is not so much, God, why don't you act? But our questions are really more, God, why don't you act now? It's not a question of God's ability. It's a question of God's timing. Uh, dear Lord, uh, we know that eventually... <coughs> the wicked will be defeated. We know that eventually the tears will be wiped away, but why does he allow the enemies at our gate now? Why doesn't God act more quickly? And so the lesson of Psalm 139, I believe, as you look at all four stanzas, I believe the lesson for you and I, which really leads to our application, is that we must trust his timing. You must trust his timing with the challenges that you have in your life. Trust his timing. And the two theological words that we need in order to trust God's timing are patience and endurance. God's timing is usually slower than our timing. And as we confess theological truth, it is true that God knows everything. Don't deny that. It's true. It's true that God is everywhere. That's a comfort to us. It's a reason to worship Him. It's true that God has all power. But yet, God's timing is different than our timing. And until God acts in our lives, he calls us as his children to be patient. Be patient. Wait for me to act. And he calls on us as his children to not give up. Endure. Through the difficulty. I know it's hard. I will act, but not yet. And until I do, don't give up. Endure and be patient. 
David ends this psalm with a beautiful prayer at the end of verse 24. <coughs> David says, and lead me in the everlasting way. That's where David ends, and that's where you and I must end. That's where we must get to in our Christian lives. Lord, lead me in the everlasting way. Now, what is the everlasting way? Well, I think David's defined it for us. When you're on the everlasting way, when you're being led by God on the everlasting way, you're on a path where you're confessing truth about God. You know that you know that God knows everything, that there's nothing to be hidden from him. You know that God is everywhere, and you confess that you cannot flee from him, that he's with you and that he can help you. When you're on the everlasting path, you confess that God has all power, that he has ability, that he can act when he wants to act. But when you're on the everlasting way, being led by God, you confess those truths while at the same time you have this in your life. You have an enemy at your gate. And you have to be okay with both because you have to trust God's timing. And you walk down that path with truth about God and the sinfulness of this life with patience and endurance. Knowing that God will act, but until then we must trust his timing. And this morning I thought that you needed to know that. And I needed to be reminded of that as well. Let's pray.